All right, folks, uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, this is the second part in a series uh, where I will be selecting one general method in the laboratory and using that as a basis for probing a quality management system for assessing yourself and hopefully for refining the rest of the processes in your laboratories. Um, uh, the other Cannabis Photosynthesis C1 is available on YouTube through the PJLA website. Uh, in that, in that webinar, we took time to look at how one might verify a method, how one might assess one's method uncertainty, uh, some good calibration recommendations as well as uh, how one might respond to deviations and how if if your verification method uncertainty and calibration regime is not uh, strong and effective then uh, your ability to respond to deviations or even recognize when they occur are severely hindered a little about me I uh, got my PhD at the University of Michigan I've been doing laboratory work in the quality and analytical space for about 20 years. I'm a lead assessor to the 17025 standard. Uh, I have my own consulting firm and sit on uh, several boards of directors for some integrated cannabis groups. Um, uh, subject matter expert with a couple certificates to go with it in SPC and SQC. And uh, previously, I have served as an executive, as a faculty member, uh, and as a senior research fellow. And most of my publications and presentations are centered around the analysis of biomaterials and using good methodology to assess things that uh, necessarily, uh, by their nature, are complex. This series itself is designed to come in and help a group get oriented around the standard or polish up their practices around the standard. And this is the method I use with groups that I work with. Uh, what we do is we dive in, pick one moderate complexity process in the lab, and we basically shake it down from every direction we possibly can to uh, ascertain whether or not it's aligned with the ISO 17025 standard, but also whether or not it is uh, capable of providing the outcomes that we actually want and supporting our customers and clients. Um, uh, hopefully the things I present will allow you to clean up your documentation, maybe give you something to think about when it comes to designing processes, uh, possibly a, help you have a better mechanism for determining when uh, something is authorized to occur, uh, uh, getting a sense of what appropriate controls look like. Uh, a lot of my experience are in uh, highly regulated environments. So uh, the controls I have tend to be uh, a lot uh, more robust maybe than uh, what you've seen in the past. And then uh, making sure that uh, if you pick just one thing, then you can have a nice tight little plan do check at cycle around just that one method. There's no reason to disrupt your entire laboratory from on high if you haven't proven to yourself that you can get a single process oriented in the correct direction. Uh, and also uh, uh, trying to do something laboratory wide without having a template or a model can be difficult. So this is why I like to come in on a single method. Now, let's talk about qualification. Typically, if you are bringing in a new process or trying to establish that a, a process has been put in place to start out with, you are going to do your qualification in two phases. There will be your pre-installation qualification, which is where you state what the key requirements are before looking at vendors, and then confirm that those requirements are met or exceeded for the system and purchase plan you have in place. The second post-install qualification is something that happens right after your instrument comes online. This is where you confirm that the key requirements are being met 
at the easiest setting for your analysis. Typically, this means that you will be assessing single analyte standards where there are likely just really two species, the solvent and the analyte. Right. Ideally, this would be a scenario in which uh, you got the, the group that was installing it to prove that these performance metrics can be met. After that, you move on to things like method development, validation of that method, initial verification of the method, and then ongoing verification, which is usually your quality control program. Looking at the pre-installation type of qualification, often people focus exclusively on hardware, and that's important. But uh, to show that you have done due diligence as an organization, as a lab, as quality manager, as a lab manager, maybe even as an owner, if there's some working owners in the group today, uh, 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 we want to set what our hardware requirements are before going to market. You do not want a vendor to guide your requirements ahead of time. Instead, you need to look at what your customer base needs and what it is you are saying that you're capable of doing in your own laboratory. So in this case, because we're using cannabis potency as our testing, I'm using this baseline potency test, HPLC, with the UV vis detector. Uh, uh, and so our first requirement is going to be that we have to be able to see the analytes that we can see, and we have to be able to see them without overlap with other analytes. Uh, in addition to that, we might determine how long it needs to maintain calibration. We might state uh, explicitly how we want to detect what we want to detect with and on what scientific basis we're going to do that. We might want to say how much flexibility do we want in our system. So we might have in this instance call for multiple solvents or this might be calling for additional add-ons. Uh, uh, you may want to state what sort of rate of throughput is your absolute slowest you're willing to go. Uh, you're going to want to state things about auto sampling or add-ons or any additional mechanisms that allow you to have batch size control and run control. And then uh, in this day and age, it is absolutely critical that you know which PC system uh, is capable of automated security and OS updates. I say this because I have managed two processes in which uh, entire servers and instrument machines were crypto locked by hackers. And so if your PC system is not capable of automated security and OS updates, that is a massive oversight. So considering the software, often this is something people think about at the tail end of a purchase, which is no time to think of it at all. Instead, when you're trying to qualify, do your pre-qualification for, for this thing that you're going to onboard, or you need to challenge the vendors with these sort of key requirements. So for example, if the software conflicts with automated security and OS updates, that might be a non-starter for you. Uh, uh, you might say what the software has to be capable of doing, like integration, uh, auto calibration, the ability to identify quality control samples, standards, and uh, samples separately. Uh, uh, from a quality management standpoint, having a system that's capable of auto flagging data it, based on some set condition is very useful, especially in terms of uh, how, uh, uh, how easily it is to, to prove that you have multiple ways to stop bad data from going out. Uh, and uh, uh, I also uh, routinely want my instrument to be able to automatically data transfer to my LIMS software. And so uh, uh, if, if that's possible, then I'm going to make that a requirement. Last is looking at your vendor and what type of service you're going to be bringing in. So here's some examples of some requirements that a group might put together if they're thinking, you know, past the first two years of operation, uh, uh, knowing that a vendor will be able to supply all the components for a set amount of time, that they are capable of providing service contract commitments uh, for an extended period of time, uh, that they can give their service contract people 
really fast response times. You might also require your vendor to be able to provide thorough training, not just usage training, uh, and additional training materials for, the, for whatever technology you're working with. Uh, uh, you might put a requirement on your vendor that they be able to also uh, find preferred standards so that you don't have to do all the look the legwork finding your certified standards. And in fact, you can go so far as to make the, requ the requirement that the vendor is going to perform the qualification run. So that basically you're saying it's not installed until it meets these minimum qualification uh, specifics. Typically, if you're doing that, you're going to have them do some set of runs where you're looking at your low, middle, and high standards in order to make sure that you can make this baseline statement about accuracy, bias, and precision. So a lot of the times, uh, what people are looking for is examples. So I'm trying in these presentations to put some sample verbiage that might be useful for stating how it is you're going to initially do your pre-qualification for a thing. So in here, or uh, this is something you could see in a quality management system, certainly when helping people build out their quality management systems, this is the type of language I use routinely. So in this case, uh, uh, I'm saying that uh, uh, you need to figure out what your requirements are before going to market and that you need to document those so that you can hold yourself accountable to them. Uh, uh, in addition to that, uh, uh, if you can quantitatively assess vendors, come up with some sort of ranking system. And depending on what sort of project management or uh, uh, process management skills you've got in house, there's a lot of ways to do rankings and assessments of options that are out there. Uh, you might also have a statement in your internal policy saying what your post-installation test might look like. So in this instance, because with qualification, you're trying for the least complex environment, we're, we'd be looking at single analytes for each of the materials that we care about. And we would want that post-installation qualification give us enough data points to say something about accuracy, precision, and bias for each of those analytes and to confirm that we're capable of meeting our throughput requirements. Uh, um, you don't necessarily have to say how you are going to do the maths around that, but a statement that says that you will do something to assess those capabilities, uh, I think is important because it shows that uh, uh, when you bring something online, it's, it's being done in a thoughtful manner in a way that's consistent consistent with practices that you accept yourself that are going to provide good objective evidence to any sort of assessors or audits by customers or as you'll see at the very end of this presentation when a customer or client comes back to you challenging data a uh, good good regime in in your qualification validation verification of methods uh, can cut out a ton of headache at the back end and really make your quality manager's job much easier. So here is a, a more specific breakdown of, of what I might put in for a specific method. Because each method is different, you wouldn't want to make a global statement about what qualification entails. But uh, uh, the examples here might be that you say that your data sets between runs have to be statistically equivalent. There's a test for that. And you say, hey, if we're going to do statistics on it, it's got to be normal. It can't be skewed. Uh, in addition to that, you can say, hey, hey I never want to see two points that are further from each other than 20 relative percent. And I never want to see back-to-back -back measurements of the same thing that are off by more than 10%. These are the types of things that you can include that really lock down the methodology. And the, the big kicker here is that uh, when you have something like this, it is extremely clear what you did, why you did it, what your baseline was for acceptability, and it sets up if you have instances of turnover or you want to be able to spin up any of your analysts or any of your scientists 
to be able to reproduce this type of study. Uh, uh, it makes it really clear how to do that. And it takes a lot of the guesswork out. And so the little bit of time you spend up front setting these sort of parameters cuts down on so much later on, specifically when you're being uh, assessed or audited or inspected, depending on the geography that you reside in. Uh, also allows you to uh, basically use your quality management practices around qualification as one of your basis for market differentiation in your markets. If you can show every customer exactly how you got to the number, that's a pretty powerful thing. So what's this all mean in light of the standard? Well, uh, right up front, uh, there's a statement that the laboratory needs to remain impartial and a safeguard against impartiality. And that might seem like it's not related to qualification, but using the method of drilling in on a single method, then uh, as a basis for building out and refining your quality management system by setting the parameters for acceptability before you pull the trigger. By setting your parameters for how you're going to assess a technology and how you're going to purchase before you purchase, you remove that impartiality. Uh, you, you, uh, you remove any the impartiality from the process and you lock it down to a standard uh, before taking action. Similarly, when you make statements about how you are going to qualify a system, and this also applies to things like validation and verification, uh, before you shoot that first sample, you're setting yourself up for uh, the ability to say, we've created a standard, we then made sure that our system met that standard, as opposed to being able to show that, that you fiddled with the system for a long time and then developed a standard based on what the system seemed to be capable of, which is uh, one of the most uh, uh, difficult things to get away from. But if you're really trying to show impartiality and you're using a single method as your basis, then uh, that's something to consider. In addition to that, uh, there's some statements about what has to be in your lab. And so 5.6 is saying that you need to have people who have both the authority and the resources to execute whatever it is you have in your QMS. Now, this could be qualification, could be a lot of other things, but the, the key word in this entire section is effectiveness. And so if you define effectiveness for your facility based on your client base, based on uh, the methods you have in place, based on uh, the requirements of your local geography and uh, the people that you are beholden to uh, in your states and municipalities, then uh, it's very easy if you have a well-defined qualification process beforehand to come back and say effectiveness was first defined then we executed, then we proved it to be effective. Um, then uh, in addition to that, and this sort of dovetails into demonstration of competency later in the talk, uh, laboratory authorized personnel to perform specific lab activities, which includes development and validation and development and validation is the space you're in while you are doing qualifications. So uh, uh, by having some hard and fast rules about what a qualification looks like, like, it then becomes much easier to show what your authorization process was for executing around that. And it becomes much, much easier to say, this person completed this task to these specifications, and here it is all laid out in black and white. Uh, then the one that people think about most when it comes to the qualification process is this 644, which was sort of the bedrock of the last talk when we talked about verification, is that, that you need to verify that the equipment conforms to your specified requirements before placing it into service. So this means 
that again, specified requirements should exist before you obtain the equipment. You should know what it needs to be capable of doing, and that allows you to set your qualification and verification regimes in such a way that by the time you've completed those processes, as you have verified that the equipment conforms to your requirements. And the equipment used for measurement shall be capable of achieving the measurement accuracy and or measurement uncertainty. So this is big and it's kind of uh, uh, the end of the road in terms of what you're targeting for is that here you need to be able to prove objectively that it's capable of achieving a certain accuracy or MU. And uh, you can't do that unless you have some sort of regime in place. Uh, just summary statistics on a single batch is not gonna be sufficient. Hand waving is not sufficient here. Ultimately, the quality of your data, the quality of the thing you are delivering to your customers is based on your ability to not only know what your uncertainty or accuracy requirements are, but also being able to show and with very little effort on your part that you are in fact capable of achieving those measurements and that you are readily and routinely meeting those requirements. So review, call out your policy, call it out early, write it down. You can always go back and revise it. Uh, don't beat yourself up over it, uh, but uh, build that out. If you don't have the the expertise in-house, this is the time to go and find help. There's nothing wrong with finding a vendor, a contractor, or a consultant that's capable of helping you set good baseline policies. Uh, and then uh, the key here is that in addition to setting the policy, you need to record your decision-making around these things. If you're gonna invest $100,000 in an auto sampler, a HVLC, a UV vis detector, and a workspace, and a PC, and a service contract, uh, uh, it should be pretty clear why you made that decision because you've already given it a name. You've already called out your policy and, uh, uh, and now you have evidence, objective evidence, that, that shows that you are operating rationally, you're operating the same every time, and that uh, both management, uh, top level management, and the laboratory itself are in alignment when it comes to making decisions about technical capability and how you're going to spend your resources. So leaning into the requirements helps, means that if you use clear language, you make it quantitative whenever possible, it becomes really easy to point to uh, your evidence and say, hey, this shows effectiveness based on our definition of effectiveness. Uh, and then make it repeatable. Uh, if you put anything into your quality system that couldn't be followed by a new set of people if you had high turnover or if something uh, uh, really radical happened, people got promoted out of position really fast. Uh, you wanna be able to make sure that you're using the level of clarity when designing your policies that you would in an SOP. And so that means that uh, uh, anything you can do that would make uh, an outside person be able to pick it up and basically follow your, your train of thought is, is gonna be beneficial, not just when dealing with assessors or dealing with your uh, states or municipalities, but also as your workforce changes and matures and you onboard more things, uh, it cuts out so much effort later on. All right. So I'm going to stop right now and look at the question bank to see what types of things have popped up. All right, I don't see anything right now. At the end, I'm gonna stop again. So if there's anything you'd like me to circle back to, then please let me know and I will uh, do, do my best to address this at the end of the presentation. All right, moving on, let's talk about qualification of staff, demonstration of competency. I know that in the US, many states are starting to implement some hard and fast rules about what a qualified individual looks like. 
However, I can't account for all the states at once here, and that's some that's a separate uh, re set of requirements that need to be met uh, above and beyond whatever exists uh, in terms of the 17025 standard. So uh, there is a very easy way to know that you are making a concerted effort, a consistent effort, and a viable effort to assess training, to assess qualifications, to show competency. And that is to make a study part of the training. So uh, you might be able to say that this person has good education or good experience, or that we have documents on site that show that they were trained. But you want those all that evidence to be sufficient to allow them to reduce reproduce a multi-date validation study really by the time a person's an operator they should be able to execute with the same accuracy and precision and bias that you state your laboratory has and so one of the simplest ways to, to provide evidence that these people are competent and well-trained is to have them just redo the validation study. Uh, uh, have them show that their measurement uncertainty is basically right where your labs is. And in fact, with a single operator, uh, uh, their accuracy, bias, precision should all be better. Um, but uh, if you do that, uh, these are, these are examples of what I put into my quality management systems. I like to say that uh, that they they can generate data that's statistically indistinguishable from whatever it is we're basing our measurement uncertainty on. I also like to insert into my demonstration of competency that that they will undergo that study once with whoever their trainer is or the qualified individual and just do that you know under observation with help and then the second time that they prove their capability they do it all alone they do it without the trainer without input and then it gets reviewed just like you would any other study and if you did your qualification and verification requirements like in the last section really well it should be self-evident whether or not they have the capability of uh competently reproducing data at the standards of your laboratory uh, and that's the gold standard. Uh, we can point all day to whether or not uh, an analyst has a two-year degree or a PhD, but ultimately, the goal of your laboratory is to generate data that is consistent, data that is accurate, data that uh, is analyst independent, and that uh, is consistent with itself uh, when you assess it statistically over time, which is the ongoing verification requirement covered in the last talk. Individuals uh, might be considered qualified when all that evidence is assembled and you've included some sort of final improvement uh, approval process so that when somebody comes to you and says, yeah, but is this, is your analyst good enough? You can say, well, they reproduced the study that we use to base our uh, our precision statement on, and uh, uh, they showed that it, that they met or exceeded the laboratory's abilities, and that somebody who is qualified to assess such things looked at it, said yes, you're qualified, and then released them into the wild to be able to to work on these things as an actual operator. So the that's just an example. Everything in quotes there is just an example of how you might build it out to make sure that you have uh, a staff qualification training sort of program that's going to catch all levels. Because you'll notice here, it doesn't say how long you spend training. Your PhD person may be able to come in, read the background information, talk to the current operator for a little bit, and then generate these studies. Your non-degreed analyst might have to come in and spend a lot of time like watching webinars and training with the vendor and then working with your people. But ultimately, 
it's about getting them to this performance level where uh, they are at a competency level, however they got there, that is well documented and shows that they're capable of performing at this known level that you've called out someplace else in your system. And the easiest place to put these, since uh, all SOPs are, are going to be methodology dependent, is to put this right in there. So uh, if I've got some, some wizard who's been previously worked for an H, HPLC vendor at some point, and uh, if they can get to this point, uh, basically all on their own, and you can show their competency that way, then uh, really uh, you're looking at a scenario where your training efforts are minimal, your training investments are minimal. Unfortunately, what I see a lot of times is that folks have decided to try to piecemeal put together a training record instead of having uniform training records across the entire regime. Uh, uh, in addition to that, at, you can also make statements about the competency in the job description for the role. Because uh, that job description is going to say something about experience and education level. It's going to say something about roles and responsibilities. And so one might use a job description to point to ooh, sort of a, a foundational disposition in your organization where you say that before a person can do a thing that generates data, uh, they have to reproduce the method of uncertainty study and show that they can do that independent of help and assistance. And uh, whatever that is for each SOP, for each process might be different, but you can embed it there in the job description. So the, the, the key is that with all the varying requirements that states have uh, or that you might have for performing an analysis, again, I use the example of a non-degreed individual in a PhD working on the same process, uh, it's important that you not vary what your requirements are with regards to demonstration. Even if it uh, combines a bunch of other things, you should have some final gating at the end of your training that says now you demonstrate competency and that demonstration of competency should look the same for every individual uh, because the standards you're holding yourself to are that the data coming out of any person who's authorized should not be statistically different from the data that comes from another authorized individual. So a good question to ask yourself is, does the evidence of competency for your analyst on specifically here, this method where we're talking about cannabis potency, or all of the qualified individuals or the process as a whole show competency at a sufficient level for in-court scrutiny. Um, uh, uh, having had to go in as an expert with witness on several occasions, it's very easy in lawsuits to have, for your people to get ripped up if they don't have this evidence. But even if you never go to court, and I hope that nobody here ever does, uh, even if you never go to court, it's a good benchmark for thinking about what, what do we want in our competency packet? What do we want as that final demonstration uh, uh, to, re to really uh, indicate that we're generating good data? And, and, and what sort of data packet would we have to have to be able to stand by it in front of some objective external individuals? Uh, then, uh, as always, ask whether or not your process, the qualification process, uh, uh, or the demonstration process meets the needs of your overall process, your customers, the agencies that you have to report to, and your organization as a whole. Different cultures have different standards under which they operate, and uh, uh, having uh, a qualification process or a demonstration of competency process that is out of alignment with your core values uh, is something you need to look into. Uh, then you also want to ask yourself whether or not your process was developed based on your own expertise. By that I mean that uh, scalping a qualification or a competency standard from elsewhere when uh, there's no constraints on you and using that is, is fine. However, or 
anything you grab from somewhere else, whether it be a regulatory process, uh, regulatory body, or a uh, an established uh, nonprofit that does testing and standards, uh, you should take a moment and ask yourself, even if you adopt it, does our own expertise tell us we need to do more? Does it tell us that this is too much? Uh, uh, because ultimately, a, your processes need to be based on your own in-house expertise, and you know your customers and clients best. And so if you, if you have just sort of boilerplated something out, go back in and challenge it. And a lot of the times you're gonna see that whatever it is you pulled, put together is meeting your needs. And wherever you got it from was a solid process. Uh, but uh, you should always challenge it at least once and say, all right, should we be doing more or is this too much? Uh, uh, another way to see whether or not your training is up to snuff is, uh, and your demonstration of competency for a process is up to stuff, is to use benchmarking. Uh, find a non-competitor someplace. Uh, uh, look to your internal audit data. Uh, look at your participation in industry work groups or in your laboratory studies. Uh, uh, talk to people. Find out what your peers are doing and see if you're in the ballpark. Uh, uh, and 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 really have those conversations. So often, laboratories that are near each other in geography consider themselves strong enough competitors that they don't want to talk about this. But if you both have loyal client bases and people aren't jumping ship every every day, uh, you can have a very congenial relationship with nearby labs and start setting things up like benchmarking. Uh, uh, one of the strongest plays you can make uh, in other industries is to have uh, some external entity have a look at whether or not a person is competent based on the evidence you provide them. Uh, that'll give you a real reality check right there. Uh, uh, for most processes, that's going to be overkill, but it's an option. Uh, and then at the end of it is, is right here, when we talk about displaying your competency on something like cannabis potency, a, we're really talking about uh, having moved past uh, having moved past all these different stage gates of is the process fit? Was it qualified? Is, has it been verified? And when you talk about demonstration of competency, you're talking about qualification and verification of an individual within a process. And so uh, uh, whatever your methodology is for doing that qualification of your method or your technology or the individual, are you routinely reviewing whether or not your process is still fit? Organizations change, they grow. Uh, your markets change and they grow. And so if you're not coming back to see how you qualify people and how you qualify processes, uh, uh, things can start to slip. So now let's look back at the back at the standard. There's some really obvious ones in the 6.2 area of the standard. And uh, that includes that you need to document the competency requirements for each function. And so again, you've got a lot of leeway here in the standard, but uh, ultimately, the, if you have different requirements for that end demonstration of competency, a, what you're going to see is large variations and, and gaps in your in your training records. And so, I strongly recommend there that uh, while you can include education, qualification, training, technical knowledge, their skills, all these things. Uh, uh, having a single gate that everyone must pass through that looks the same and shows that the foundational goal of an analyst to generate reproducible data uh, that is within the quality requirements of your system is met uh, uh, using only education or only technical knowledge instead of some demonstration is, is going to be a hard sell for a lot of assessors and for a lot of auditors. Uh, 63 says is that they also have to be able to 
evaluate whether or not a deviation is significant. And if you go back to the, the previous one webinar, uh, this idea that uh, a deviation can occur and you not know it because you're not uh, tracking your process well enough, uh, means that if you can't track your process, then uh, their ability to evaluate is going to be really hindered. And this is definitely a shall statement, so that's something to take into account. Uh, laboratory shall have procedures and retain records for the competency requirements, the training, the authorization, and the monitoring of competence of personnel. And at the very beginning of the section, when I gave you an example of what you might put into your quality management system, you'll see that all four of these areas are covered in those two paragraphs. Um, uh, so that's, you know, I think uh, uh, where people tend to look first is, is did you have a policy or procedure? Did you follow it? And do you have evidence for it? And uh, you'll see this over and over again through this standard and others. But uh, uh, I think that it is worth noting that if you say that there's a competency requirement, you have to have some evidence that they have crossed over that threshold from not competent to competent. Uh, uh, and you need to have something that shows that when you do that, it's tied to a person and that that gets assessed and approved. And then uh, uh, you have some way to monitor the competence of the person. So that monitoring is an on, when you see monitoring, it's not a one-time event, that's ongoing. Uh, uh, and then 663, laboratory shall communicate its requirements to external providers for competence, including any requirement required qualification of personnel. So this is for things like uh, uh, subcontractors, temporary labor, if you have workforce people that are there on contract or short-term contract. Uh, uh, it also means that in instances where there are things that you cannot touch yourself, uh, you're making sure that your vendors and contractors, subcontractors know what your expectations are and that, that you're going to be holding them to those expectations. All right, moving on past that into laboratory hygiene. This will be really short. Uh, my intent here is to uh, uh, wrap up with hygiene and then uh, open some things up to questions and give you one good example of why excellent qualification, verification, and training documentation and training studies uh, can really make you a powerhouse when it comes to dealing to, with customer response. But an aside here is on hygiene. It doesn't really fit in anywhere else. Uh, uh, Here's some areas of the standard that re re relate to the environment that people are working in. So often people assume that this just means humidity or temperature or dusting or washing glassware. Uh, uh, so, you know, first off, the environment and the facilities can't affect the validity of results. Uh, it has to be such a space where you can show that your results aren't compromised and that uh, your conditions are only providing a baseline for operation and are not the thing that your operations responds to implicitly. The requirements for the facilities are that, uh, that you have your standards and that you're going to document them. So uh, uh, what it is you say you're going to do in terms of hygiene and environmental effects in the lab, but uh, when we talk about environmental, we, we really are talking about lab cleanliness. Um, so when they say environmental conditions, uh, often we think of that just as moisture, but uh, I can tell you that if I see a food or sample crumbs on a keyboard, that's the environment. That's where you're getting your numbers, and I'm going to be concerned about that. Measures to control facilities shall be implemented, monitored, and periodically reviewed. That periodically reviewed is key. It means that uh, you are taking the time to look and see whether or not what you have is good enough or possibly too much. 
But all of these uh, types of reviews uh, uh, should cover multiple areas. So who can go where? As soon as a person can touch a sample, as soon as a person can touch the glassware, as soon as somebody can go to the cleaning space, what effect does that have? Uh, prevention of contamination. Uh, uh, so uh, I'm going to give some examples here in a second, but uh, contamination is an area, especially when you've got so many samples that are similar to each other uh, in the laboratory. Uh, I worry about how people store their standards, what sort of chemicals are within reach of the instrument, how is it we are doing uh, vessel transfers, what's our labeling activities when we do that, those types of things. And then effective separation between areas with incompatible laboratory activities. Well, incompatible laboratory activities in a safety compliance lab largely means that you have to have a space that is just for the analysis you're doing. Uh, uh, and uh, so often I see a bleed over effect because people want consumables nearby, but not in their space. Or uh, we just keep the solvent between us and trust that the other analyst uses the right, never get dirties up the solvent, things like that. So a few things in the hygiene spaces uh, that, that can help you set hygiene standards is uh, 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 having some sort of visual cue of when you have a clean space or a dirty space. Um, I have seen analysts using their phones as timers. First off, that phone's not calibrated. Second off, if you touch your phone without gloves, it means you have a phone in the lab and you're touching it at while you're in the lab uh, uh especially in the biospaces that's super critical if i see somebody touch a phone with a glove it's like they don't even have gloves on anymore uh uh drinks in laboratories uh typically uh if you're doing any safety compliance work uh all those drinks should be lidded there shouldn't be a way to cross contaminate there should be no food in the lab i've seen laboratories that have Launch space storage in uh, in basically the same space as the lab. Uh, that's huge no-no. Uh, you have to get it out of there. It also means when people clean up after eating and stuff, you can't be using the same sinks that you use to clean glassware. Uh, storage of materials. I see a lot of standards stored above analytical spaces. As soon as you put the analytes of interest in a space above your instrumentation or on the same counter next to the place where you handle the instrumentation or you do long-term storage in a place where you've got samples passing over keyboards, mice, those sort of things. Uh, that can be a major problem. Uh, also, there's a difference between active space practices. So this is when the analyst is there by themselves. What's their workflow? How do they cross uh, across the area? Uh, if they're, you know, for example, uh, what do they do after they touch the keyboard? Can you even touch the keyboard without keys, without a gloves? If you're touching the keyboard without gloves, then you can never touch the keyboard with gloves. Things like that. Uh, making sure that samples don't pass over other samples. Making sure that uh, samples never pass over solvents. Uh, do you label before or after transporting or splitting? Uh, material, those types of practices. Then the in-use practices is how the rest of the people in the lab behave around a person who's currently performing an analysis. Are they giving them the space they need? Are they interrupting them? Are they bringing things into their space, like dirty objects, stuff from dirty spaces, and talking to them? Uh, then also, what are your storage standards? Uh, are you adequately uh, uh, allocating space to be able to keep your materials separate because when we talk about appropriate separation between uh, uh, working processes that can also oh, apply to how you store out of use equipment or modules that aren't currently in use or consumables or repair parts and it's uh, very easy to look inside something that's supposed to be a pristine parts drawer and find out that it's, you know, it's got dust or people have been storing vials in there or somebody uh, put their lab notebook on top of some glassware. Uh, so those are the types of things I worry about when it comes to hygiene. Uh, 
covered most of this. Uh, big area though is with computer systems. What are people doing to make sure that their computer is either always a dirty space or always a clean space? Because you cannot be both. Uh, so often uh, I see the analysts interacting with their mouse and their keyboards in an ad hoc fashion. Uh, often they got their phone sitting right there. Well, if you got gloves on and you're touching your phone, again, it's like you don't have gloves on. It's also like you want to smear your phone all over your work area. Uh, then it's also, I think, worth noting that there's a difference between your hygiene PM versus sort of your daily operation for a process. Uh, 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 PM hygiene is where you set some sort of schedule to do preventance maintenance type activities on the hygiene of the laboratory. And uh, giving somebody ownership of that, especially if you're trying to maybe uh, get somebody to have a little bit more uh, pride over their workspace and a desire to see it See a cleaner, uh, that's an excellent uh, place to uh, put a analyst who has interest in uh, maybe more than just performing analytical work. Uh, often those thresholds are end of work day, start of work day. And a lot of the hygiene issues that I see in laboratories, specifically in the safety compliance space, are due to the organizations not giving people a place to store their food, store their drinks, store their phone, put their spare shoes if they're changing out shoes before doing bio work things like that and uh, uh a lot of hygiene issues can be alleviated by giving people a safe space to retreat to where they can touch their stuff uh and so uh that is something worth thinking about all right here is my final little demonstration and it is that uh what you can do using the types of tests that I mentioned earlier. So in this example uh, for THC by HPLC UV, a, an initial measurement uncertainty study was done. It was three separate batches calibrated against different curves, uh, uh, done with an N of seven, and then completed uh, uh, as part of a precision statement study before implementing a thing into production. A client comes back and asks how confident we are in the number that we just got. So rather than running it a whole bunch, and eating up a bunch of bandwidth, the quality manager goes back and looks at the measurement uncertainty study and then grabs the demonstration of competency study that that analyst had and provides in a single graphic uh, the objective evidence to show that the method is capable, the analyst was competent, and then by going to uh, your ongoing verification, that is to say your SPC or SQC, being able to show that the run and the rerun that you did both had quality control components that were well within, well within, the standard of your process. Uh, it allows you to then come back and say, here's our confidence level in that number. Or, or this is letting them know that it's an unbiased test. And, and uh, you just come back with the evidence. Don't waste all this bandwidth having your lab manager and the analyst and a senior scientist and the site manager all have to look at this thing. You just literally sit down change out data sets on a spreadsheet that you've already got sitting there and then present the data back to the client and have that as just a process that you do. As soon as your data comes into question, this is what you do. And it's very powerful, very fast, saves you a ton of time and headache and uh, uh, really, again, could be a market differentiator. All right, so now I'm going to go to questions. I am going to come in and I'm looking here at the first question. Where would I find the particular specs for environmental conditions? So this, there, with the ISO 17025 standard, there is no set of specs for environmental conditions. Rather, if you say that you are doing a method and that method requires 
a certain amount of uh, of humidity or a certain temperature or a certain barometric pressure, that's one type of environmental condition. Another, another uh, area is for you to declare what your environmental expectations are. So for example, by setting a laboratory wide standard that this is how clean spaces and dirty spaces work, uh, if you violate this rule, this is the actions we take when dealing with that. You can also get online particulate analyzers. You can also just come through and do your own swabs. If you're doing bio work, you can swab your own space and uh, uh, check and see is that, can you culture off that mouse? Well, if the mouse is supposed to be a clean space and you're you know, wiping it down at certain end of business, that, that can, uh, you can set your own standards that way. But most of the environmental specifications for a method, for this method at least, are going to be based on uh, operating conditions uh, for the instrument and what's going on in the ambient environment. All right, coming down underneath this. Effective separation means it should be an enclosed space or can it be open but cordoned off to the other standard? So again, that uh, effective separation, again, from the, the standards viewpoint is that at the separation should be sufficient that one methodology and all the things associated with it do not pose a threat to the other methodology and vice versa. So you can have two separate processes occurring on the same bench. And as long as the separation is sufficient so that vibrations don't affect it, uh, people aren't crossing over each other, their samples couldn't possibly get mixed up, that's fine. Uh, but uh, if you say in your quality management system that you need to uh, uh, put up a divider, then that, that's a different beast. Uh, so uh, the standard itself doesn't, doesn't give you guidance on that. It says that you should determine what the appropriate amount of separation is, what that needs to look like for your lab, for your methods. Obviously, you're going to use a interact with an HPLC UV method in a very different way than you would with the GC mass spec method. And so uh, taking, taking the time and determining what that separation needs to look like. And what you're gonna find is that uh, each process has its own separation or environmental conditions you need to adhere to. So any place where you're doing cell culturing is gonna be handled way different than the process in which you are doing uh, say sample preparation for UV vis. Um, those, those, uh, you're gonna have some baseline things that are the same, but process by process, how much elbow room someone needs, whether or not it can be in a, uh, in a hallway or you're gonna put it at the end of the line. You know, some processes work much better in the corner because people are not passing by all the time. So your lab layout's gonna play a factor and uh, uh, you know, basically your acreage is gonna dictate a lot of that. So uh, I am looking to see if I have any additional questions right now. And we see, don't see any more in the lineup here. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to sit with me today. Hopefully these last two webinars have been useful and uh, sort of giving you some ideas of how you might probe your system by just picking one method and trying to clean it up. All right, everyone have a safe and wonderful day and uh, take care of yourselves. Goodbye.